Okay, so I will first uh, start by thanking my uh, co-organizer for doing all the hard work, actually. And, um, <clears throat> and so also I start, I'll paraphrase a bit uh, Jim's in introduction with uh, uh, some sort of similar slide, but uh, I think now you have understand that uh, the rate of development varies across species. Just for the anecdote, this is a, a picture I took while I was doing my uh, actually postdoc in uh, Nogent-sur-Marne uh, with Nicole Ledorin. And uh, that was the beginning of the RU486, uh, so we were starting to get a few human embryos uh, from uh, Bruno Peo, who was starting his group uh, uh, there. And, and so I had the, the chance to get uh, one a very nice uh, specimen and could compare it next to the chicken embryo. And so indeed, what's, what's quite remarkable here, it's uh, the, the fact that you can achieve a very similar morphological structure in a timing which is uh, uh, surprisingly different uh, given that uh, these two processes are taking place roughly at the same temperature. And so <clears throat> that's something I've been uh, uh, interested in uh, for, for a long time. And, um, and, and so one of the questions if you start thinking about developmental timing is, is how do you measure developmental timing? And so you've seen already this uh, slide from, uh, from Mickey. And, and so what developmental biologists have done for many years is to uh, establish the sort of classification of stages which uh, uh, reflect landmarks of uh, development. So here for the mouse, these are the Tyler stages. For the human, these are the, the Carnegie stages. For chicken, that would be the hamburger Hamilton stages. And, and then try to align uh, these different uh, stages between species, but um, this is not a very precise way to uh, uh, do it because, um, in, in fact, because not all organs develop at the same pace uh, in species. That's what is uh, usually called uh, heterochrony, which makes it uh, uh, quite difficult to compare. So there, uh, there is a need for a more um, uh, precise uh, or, or the, the neoteny we just uh, uh, heard from. Uh, Pierre uh, in the previous talk. So, so there is a need for a, a more uh, precise way to measure time. And, uh, and, and there is a, a classical way that uh, embryologists have used for a long time uh, uh, in, the, in the vertebrate field uh, as, a, as a ruler for, for time, which is uh, the, to count the number of somites. So, so the somites, uh, which are shown here in red, are these... Uh, 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 structures which correspond to epithelial spheres that are uh, uh, periodically distributed along uh, the anteroposterior axis. They will give rise to the axial skeleton and to the skeletal muscle, uh, as well as to a few more uh, derivatives. And they are formed from uh, this tissue here, the, which is called the presomitic mesoderm, uh, which exhibits the, the oscillation that, that, that we heard about, which uh, itself derives from um, the, the early on the primitive streak and then the tail bud uh, through the neuromesodermal precursors or, or, or NMPs. And so <clears throat> these uh, uh, somites, because of their uh, regularity, um, have been used, as I said, to uh, stage the, som the, the embryos for a very long time. And so I'm, I'm showing you here an illustration of, of this in the chicken embryo. So here is a movie of the development of an embryo. You can see the rhythmic uh, addition of somites which proceeds in a sequential fashion such that an embryo that has uh, more somite is uh, obviously older than one that has less. And, and in the chicken embryo, um, the somites form every 90 minutes such that, as you can see here, you can, uh, uh, you can get an idea of the, the real time uh, that has elapsed uh, between the formation of somites, and, and then you can reason, uh, try to reason in, in absolute time using this, uh, uh, this uh, system. And uh, <clears throat> an important aspect for, for our discussion is that the, uh, the rhythm of somite formation uh, scales with embryonic time, and you can play with temperature, for instance, to change the, uh, both the pace of uh, embryonic time and the pace of somite formation. And this remains uh, in synchrony, something which is uh, a pretty fascinating uh, property of uh, developing embryos. And, um, and, and as uh, we heard, it also 
it, it's quite different be, uh, between species. So human embryos develop slowly, so they have a slower somatogenesis period compared to mouse or to uh, zebrafish that, or, or fish that have a very fast uh, period and a very fast uh, developmental time. So, so, and, and somites are added up to a, a significant number, so, so usually uh, it's around 50 or 65 uh, in mouse and up to several hundreds in, in some uh, 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 outsiders like, like snakes. But uh, for a reasonable uh, period of time, which is also uh, corresponds to the phylotypic stage, you can use this as a measure uh, uh, of time in embryos. Of course, it's a, it's a relative measure, measure because it depends on, on the species. But within that species, you can use uh, absolute time. So, <clears throat> as I said, the, the somite is a rhythmic process. And, uh, and, and so there's been a number of models uh, trying to uh, account for the rhythmic production of somites, starting with uh, uh, reaction uh, diffusion models after uh, Turing's work. And, uh, but an important, uh, uh, a very influential model at the time uh, was uh, uh, proposed by Jonathan Cook, um, um, a developmental biologist, and, and Chris Zeman, a mathematician. Uh, this is the, the so-called clock and wavefront model which was uh, based on the theory of catastrophes that was developed here uh, by uh, René Tom, uh, with the idea that the formation of the somite was uh, akin to one such uh, mathematical catastrophe, like this is a cusp catastrophe, a bit uh, akin to a um, bistable transition. And in order to make this catastrophe uh, uh, periodic, as is seen in the somites, they postulated the existence of an oscillator which in the model is essentially a, an ad hoc uh, addition. It, it's, uh, th there's, no specific, th there's no specific mathematical rational beyond uh, making the, the catastrophic uh, uh, periodic uh, for, for uh, the addition of the oscillator. And, and of course, and there is a second system which is called the wavefront, which essentially controls the, the displacement of the oscillator in space and ensures that uh, the oscillations uh, occur in, in domains that are uh, progressively more uh, posterior in order to uh, make the periodic series and convert the temporal periodicity of the uh, oscillator into the spatial uh, uh, periodic organization of the somites. And so, and, and 20 years uh, after uh, this, we, uh, with Isabel Palmerim, who was a PhD uh, student in the lab, we found a class of genes that uh, show such a rhythmic expression uh, uh, identifying an oscillator, as was proposed in, uh, in the cook zeman model. And so here is a, a chicken embryo showing a, a time window of 90 minutes, which is the time to form one somite. And, uh, and these genes were expressed uh, as a traveling wave, which is illustrated here in blue, and that you can see here by a bridization in situ, in this 15 somites, 16 somites, or 17 somites embryo. And you can see that these waves are reproduced each time a new somite form, thus demonstrating some sort of uh, uh, periodic process at the molecular level that anticipates the formation of the somite. And so work from, from many labs, uh, including uh, uh, mine, have now uh, shown that this oscillator is a, is a gene regulatory network that involves three major signaling pathways, at least in, in mouse and, and humans, FGF, notch, and wind. The, the so-called cyclic genes that show these traveling waves are mostly negative feedback in, uh, inhibitors of this pathway, which led to uh, uh, some uh, mathematical uh, models um, involving uh, transcription uh, feedback loop with delays, as uh, for instance for the, the HER genes, as uh, uh, Mickey mentioned this morning, for the HES7 gene that uh, is able to negatively, its own, negatively uh, regulate its, its own expression as this uh, probably acting as a pacemaker, at least for the notch part of the oscillator. And, and there's been also uh, the development of a number of uh, systems to visualize these oscillations. You've, you've uh, seen already a few from, from Mickey this morning. And, um, and <coughs> this was initially pioneered by uh, Ryo Kageyama in Japan, who developed Lucifer's based reporter. And Alex Olela, when he was in the lab, developed a, a GFP-based uh, reporter. Uh, which he introduced in a mouse embryo, and, and you can see uh, with this reporter the, the traveling waves associated to the clock. You see that uh, they sweep along the tissue each time a segment forms, 
and they end up as a stripe that uh, materialized the future uh, boundaries of the somite. And so, <clears throat> so the clock uh, is thought to define the, the, the rhythm of somite formation, the, so the temporal component of the system. But as I said, you need a, a second component, a spacing component, which is called the wavefront, and which uh, uh, work uh, from my lab also, but uh, also from uh, Takeda's lab in Japan and, and others, uh, um, uh, showed to be to involve a, a system of posterior gradients involving F, G, F, and, and wind signaling. And the idea here is that uh, this gradient establish a threshold along the presomitic mesoderm uh, that defines the level at which the cells can start to respond to the periodic signal of the clock. And here you see an illustration of this gradient with the FGF8 ligand, which is, shows this uh, nice uh, high posterior to low anterior distribution. This is phosphoerc, which is a response to FGF signaling, and nuclear beta-catenin, which is also uh, enriched in the posterior end of the embryo. So. Uh, interestingly, this, uh, this gradient is established by an unusual system, not a classical source and six system, but uh, uh, by a, a, an RNA decay mechanism whereby only the, the cells that are located in the tail bud in this NMP region transcribe uh, the ligands uh, um, uh, for, uh, uh, this, which are important for establishing this gradient, such as FGF8. And you can see this using intronic probes. You see that transcription is restricted to the tail bud here. And yet there is plenty of messenger RNA uh, that you can see with this exonic probe in the tissue. And that's because the transcription is restricted here. And when the descendants of these NMPs exit into the presomitic mesoderm, they are loaded with mRNA, which starts to decay. And because the elongation continues, uh, this establishes a gradient of messenger RNA along the tissue. And, and this is a fairly uh, a generic concept that you can apply to other ligands like wind and also to, to the proteins. But what is interesting here, and especially in the, the context of this uh, meeting, I think is that this is a, definitely a form of timer because uh, the, the decay of uh, um, the FGF8 uh, 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 mRNA here is really going to control the position of this threshold that is the time when the cells become competent to activate the segmentation program. So it's, it's, um, I just added this slide because I think it's interesting to contrast this to the clock systems and, and particularly the segmentation clock, which uh, does not really, uh, uh, that, that essentially uh, uh, specifies a periodic information. This is more of a, a timing information which is delivered here. And so, so this is a sort of dynamic uh, view of the, the system. This is the, the, the posterior gradient of FGF and wind signaling. One of the advantages of this RNA decay system also is that it ensures the coordination between the posterior regression of the gradient and uh, the, uh, 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 the maintenance of uh, the position of this determination front along the, the tissue. And so when you combine the two elements of the system, uh, what you have is uh, so these uh, pulses of signaling that are shown as these blue traveling waves along the tissue, and they can uh, be read at the level uh, of the determination front. So in the cells that passed this competence threshold, they become uh, competent to respond to the clock signal, and they do so by activating so-called segmentation genes shown here in black, uh, such as MES2. And so the idea is that this system uh, is able to explain how you can uh, specify a rhythmic stripes of genetic information in such a sequential fashion. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, this was all done in uh, model organisms, in, in, uh, mostly in chicken, mouse, and, and also zebrafish. Um, and, and, and we were interested in, uh, in trying to um, learn whether uh, there would be also such a, a similar system uh, operating in humans. This is uh, uh, clearly not possible to study it uh, directly in embryos, or at least not to study so the, the dynamic characteristics of the system, because uh, in humans, somatogenesis takes place very early, as you, as you heard, between three and, uh, and four and a half, five weeks. So at a time when women usually don't even know they're they are pregnant, and there are very, very few um, embryos available at these stages. What we knew, though, is that 
uh, uh, through a number of classical linkage studi studies in uh, patients from uh, consanguineous families uh, uh, affected by this uh, disorder called uh, congenital scoliosis, which means essentially uh, uh, a completely scrambled uh, uh, segmental organization of the, spa of the, spa the vertebral column and the ribs. Uh, all the genes that were identified by this linkage analysis uh, and, and which uh, were um, giving a phenotype in, uh, as recessive uh, mutants uh, belong to the segmentation clock. So this included genes like lunatic fringe, which is a notch modifier, delta-3, which is a notch ligand, has 7 that we heard about from, uh, uh, from Mickey this morning, MES2, which is the, the response to the clock. So really suggesting that uh, there was uh, some sort of causal link between uh, the, the, the clock system and uh, uh, human segmentation. So we spent quite a bit of time uh, uh, developing protocols to differentiate um, ES cells to uh, the presomitic mesoderm fate with a long-term goal to try to recapitulate uh, these oscillations. So this was started uh, here, uh, uh, well, in fact, it was even started by Jérôme Schall when, uh, when we were at the Stowers Institute in Kansas City, but uh, mostly developed when, uh, when we were in Strasbourg at the IGBMC. And so Jérôme first developed protocols uh, uh, based on, on uh, known uh, developmental cues that are important for the, the presomitic mesoderm specification. So he, he developed the protocols for first for mouse ES cells and then transposed them to human ES cells. And so these cues are mostly a wind activator, Karen, and the BMP inhibitor. And with these two compounds in the medium, you can drive your uh, human um, ES or IPS cells, which are at the epiblast, so that is at the pre-gastrulation stage. Uh, you can drive them within a one day to uh, uh, become uh, equivalent to neuromesodermal progenitors, so these tail bud precursors. And within another day, they uh, become essentially uh, uh, all presomitic mesoderm, so the posterior presomitic mesoderm, expressing markers like uh, mesogenin 1. So we engineered reporters that express, that uh, uh, have the venous fluorescent uh, protein into the mesogenin 1 locus. And, uh, and we see that up to 95% or so of the cells uh, uh, start to activate this gene, which is very specific for this green domain here. So very efficient uh, a protocol uh, uh, to differentiate these human cells to a state uh, that appears similar to the posterior presomitic mesoderm. And so, of course, I have to, uh, that's my legal uh, UMAP. And, uh, <coughs> and so what you see is that if you sequence cells at different days, zero, one, two, and three, they organize into one single developmental trajectory. And, uh, and if you look at the genes deployed during this trajectory, this is the pseudo time, they're all expected uh, genes that are marker of uh, the NMPs and uh, then of the posterior presomitic mesoderm. And, and also you can note that uh, the differentiation is very coordinated, very uh, uh, synchronized uh, among the system. So, so that means that here we have a, an ideal system uh, to study the differentiation of the uh, presomitic mesoderm in humans. And, uh, and then what uh, Margarete Diaz Quadros, who was a PhD student in the lab, did was to uh, engineer a, a cyclic reporter, a bit like the one I showed you in mouse earlier on. But uh, there she introduced a destabilized version of Achilles, which is a fast folding, very bright, uh, GFP that was uh, developed by uh, Miyawaki in Japan. And so she introduced this construct uh, uh, following a 2A peptide uh, at the end of the H7 cyclic gene. And this was destabilized by uh, PES sequence and, and other sequences. And, um, and then she differentiated these reporter cells to the presomitic mesoderm stage. And, uh, and lo and behold, she was able to uh, uh, see that these cells uh, not only had acquired a presomitic mesoderm identity, but were also able to recapitulate oscillations uh, uh, evoking the segmentation clock. And with this uh, GFP-based system, what you can do is you can track the, the fluorescence in I individual cells, and you see that the, the, the oscillations uh, in single cells are tightly uh, synchronized 
and you can also from uh, this uh, data extract uh, the period of uh, the, the human segmentation clock, which is about five hours, which is, as you heard, about two and a half, three times uh, the period of mouse. And so, and, and, and so this work and also work from uh, the group of uh, Chanta Salef in, in Kyoto and, and Miki and, um, and um, from uh, Jamie Thompson also in Wisconsin uh, identified for the first time the, the human segmentation clock. Uh, and, and characterize this period. So, so then we started to think that we uh, uh, could use this system to uh, study the control of the, the period of somatogenesis and, and hence use this as a proxy for developmental timing. And, uh, and as you heard, so, so the mouse development is much faster than human development and, and uh, scales by about a factor two to three. And uh, so what, uh, what Margarete did is to uh, compare first the differentiation of uh, reporter lines that express the mesogenin 1 marker, which marks the onset of uh, the posterior presomatic mesoderm fate. So she compared the kinetics of uh, activating this gene in mouse and in human. And as you see, there is uh, 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 the expected scaling of, of about two, uh, uh, two times. Uh, uh, between mouse and human, and uh, such that the, the cells starting from uh, the epiblast stage uh, uh, um, activate uh, uh, this mesogenin or acquire this posterior presomatic mesoderm state. And then what she did was to uh, engineer the same reporter in the mouse line as she had generated in the human line, so she introduced H7, uh, uh, the, the Achilles construct, into the S7. Uh, in the locus in mouse. As you can see here, the fluorescence is much lower, so don't be misled. These are, these are uh, dying cells that are strongly labeled. The, the real labeling is, uh, is lower, and this is because of the kinetics of the system. So here you have much more time to accumulate the GFP, and hence you get a much uh, better signal compared to mouse. But you can nevertheless uh, easily measure uh, the oscillations uh, uh, using the, the, the mouse reporter line. And as you see, they're about two to three times as fast as uh, the oscillations that are seen uh, in the human cells. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, I, I didn't put the slide, but uh, the other thing that uh, she noticed is that uh, not only does the segmentation clock scale, but she also saw that the cell cycle is about twice as fast in uh, these presomatic mesoderm cells uh, compared to uh, um, between mouse and, and human. So then we, <coughs> we started to uh, uh, wonder about what could be causing uh, such a difference. And as you already show, I think from, from James, it's known that uh, uh, in animals, there is a, a global scaling between the gestation period and the body mass. So as we heard from Mickey, the gestation period is not uh, an absolute proxy for uh, development. It is not a great measure because there's no real correlation between the stage at which embryos are born in different species and, and the true uh, developmental stage. But nevertheless, it's true that there is a trend uh, uh, suggesting that smaller animals tend to have a shorter gestation period and hence uh, a shorter uh, developmental period compared to large animals. And now there is also this uh, famous Kleiber law, which says that uh, the basal uh, metabolic rate of animals uh, uh, scales with uh, this exponent of three quarter with uh, their body mass. And so if you take these two uh, observations um, that suggest that maybe there is some scaling between the gestation period and hence the, the developmental timing and uh, the basal metabolic rate. And so this is what we uh, uh, decided to investigate. Here I want also to say a word of caution that uh, these laws are not uh, by any means absolute laws and they suffer a lot of exceptions. And, and this might explain also some of the discrepancies that, uh, that, that we've seen uh, between our data. So, <clears throat> so what Margarete started to do first was to measure, uh, the, the compare the metabolic rate uh, 
the oxygen consumption rate between mouse and human uh, using a seahorse assay, so uh, uh, adding the same number of cells uh, for mouse and for human, and she couldn't see any difference uh, between uh, the two species, both for the oxygen consumption rate and for the gly glycolytic uh, uh, proton extrusion rate. So we were really surprised and puzzled by this, but she realized that uh, the human cells were much bigger, and hence it was not making sense to compare uh, directly the, uh, uh, the, these rates without scaling by either the volume or, or the mass. And, uh, and so then we teamed up with uh, Timo Mitin and in uh, the Scott Manalis lab, we developed a very sophisticated system to measure uh, both the, um, the, the, the volume, the density, and, and the mass of individual cells. It's uh, using uh, a resonating cantilever. Uh, where the cells in suspension modify the, the uh, vibrating frequency of the, the cantilever, and from this they can extract uh, uh, properties such as the buoyancy of the cells and, and so on. And so from this, uh, uh, Tim was, uh, Timo was able to measure very precisely the, the volume of the cells in the two species, the mass, and uh, then get the density. And so you see that the cells uh, exhibit very similar densities, they, uh, the mass is about twice as high uh, for human cells, and the volume is also twice as high for human cells. So this, of course, uh, meant that we had to normalize the seahorse data for metabolism, and when you do so, you normalize by mass, you see that uh, the, the mouse cells' uh, metabolism is, is twice as fast as uh, the uh, human cells, and that's also true for the, the glycolytic rate. So <clears throat> one simple way to explain this would be to imagine that there are more mitochondria uh, in mouse, and uh, that's actually the case. So if you label the cells with mitotracker uh, green and you compare uh, the, the, the number, uh, the intensity of fluorescence, you can get an idea of the, the uh, density of mitochondria in the cells, and you see that uh, this density is much higher uh, in the mouse cells than it is in the, in the human, always same uh, type of uh, scaling factor. I'm not showing you the data, but Margaret also showed that uh, not only there are more mitochondria in mouse, but they're also more active uh, than the, the human mitochondria. So this was uh, uh, suggesting that uh, the, the, the mitochondria might be a, a central uh, control for, for this process, or at least an, an important element of the, the control of the uh, uh, regulation of the period of the oscillations. And so she started to interfere with uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the electron transport chain, which is involved in the, uh, 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 first in the oxidation of uh, NADH and, and then the transfer of electron to build this a gradient of protons, which is then used by the ATP synthase to produce ATP. And so she, um, uh, she treated cultures of uh, reporter cells that exhibit the, the uh, oscillating reporter, and she measured uh, the impact of inhibiting either complex one with rotenone, antimycin is complex three, and, and sodium azide for complex four. Uh, she measured the impact on the period, and as you see, uh, there is a significant impact of inhibiting these elements of the complex uh, uh, of the electron transport chain of, on the, the period uh, of the oscillation. What was quite surprising in turn is that if you look at the effect of either oligomycin, which blocks the ATP synthase, or FCCP, which is an uncoupling agent which disrupts the proton gradient, you don't see an effect on the period. And, uh, and this doesn't mean that these drugs have no effect, they have very serious uh, effect on the cells. But if you measure on a re reasonable time frame, because all these experiments are done uh, with sublethal uh, doses, uh, you see that uh, here there's no impact on the, on the period, whereas this drug definitely slowed down uh, the oscillations. So that was somehow uh, uh, suggesting that uh, ATP production was not critical in the control of uh, the, 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 the timing aspect or the, the rate of the process, and, and suggesting that uh, another very important aspect of the electron transport chain might be implicated, and this is the oxidation of uh, NADH, uh, which leads to the production of NAD plus, 
which is a very important cofactor uh, in many biosynthetic reactions and, and controls the redox status uh, of the cells. So the, the NADH is mostly produced by the TCA cycle and, and the glycolysis, and, uh, and it's uh, oxidized at this level and delivers the electrons that will be transferred down the electron transfer chain to uh, generate the, the gradient. So, <clears throat> so if uh, NAD is uh, important, then you might, exp you might expect the uh, NAD over NADH ratio to scale between a mouse and human. And so for this, we uh, teamed up with uh, Owen Skinner in the Vamsi Mutaz lab. Vamsi is an expert on the uh, mitochondrial uh, physiology. And um, as a proxy for uh, the NAD and NADH ratio, uh, what people in the field are using is the lactate over pyruvate uh, ratio in the extracellular medium, which is a proxy for this uh, intracellular ratio. And, uh, and so Owen measured uh, this in the mouse and the human cells. And as you see here, uh, he indeed saw that uh, uh, this ratio was uh, twice higher in human cells. And because this is the invert to the NAD, NADH, that means that in reality, the NAD over NADH ratio is twice higher in mouse compared to human. So that was fitting uh, with the idea that an important uh, uh, component of the system is uh, this uh, uh, NAD over NADH ratio. And then <clears throat> what we wanted to see, of course, is so all that, that I've shown you so far is, is kind of loss of function experiments trying to uh, decrease uh, the pace of the oscillations. And, uh, and of course, you can always argue that uh, we're making the cells sick, and so we'd like to see a gain of function. We want to speed up the clock. And I'm not uh, aware of any uh, uh, experiments in the literature that, that can really do this in, a, in, in any uh, efficient way. The only example I know which is particularly striking is the snake, where we showed that the segmentation clock has a, a very significantly accelerated pace. But uh, pharmacologically, it's not really been shown uh, that you can uh, accelerate the pace uh, significantly. And so, Again, we uh, uh, teamed up with uh, Vamsi's lab, and, and they have characterized an enzyme uh, called uh, Elbinox, which is uh, NADH oxidase from uh, Lactobacillus brevis. And what it does is to uh, oxidize uh, NADH to NAD plus uh, generating uh, water. And uh, so it bypasses entirely uh, the electron transport chain, and thus it can uh, act on the NAD-NADH ratio. So Margrethe cloned this enzyme in an antivirus, and then she infected the presomatic mesoderm cells. And what she sees is uh, when you infect the cells is an increase of the NAD over NADH ratio, and then a decrease of the segmentation clock uh, period. And so it's not huge, but it's, it's 15, 20%, which is a, a very uh, a significant uh, steer. Uh, um, decrease. And so, as I said, uh, to me, it's uh, the first clean pharmacological decrease of the segmentation clock pace that I'm aware of. And so, <clears throat> as, as we heard also, there's been uh, uh, other uh, hypotheses for the control of the, the developmental pace that have been proposed through the, the nice work that you heard from uh, uh, James Briscoe and, and from Mickey Bisuya who proposed that uh, the, the control of gene expression uh, um, was scaling between mouse and, and humans, the work from uh, Mickey's lab. Uh, but that includes the whole process, so that is uh, the, the whole uh, delay, transcription plus uh, translation, or the work from, uh, from James and also from uh, Mickey uh, showing the, the, the importance of the protein half-life um, in, um, in this process. So, so we decided to look at this because uh, the NA, I mean, the redox status doesn't really tell you how uh, uh, this might control uh, developmental speed. And so, what uh, Margrethe uh, did first is to measure the global proteasome activity, and she saw exactly what uh, uh, what uh, James and uh, Mickey had seen. That is, it's much higher in uh, the mouse compared to human. But uh, uh, a bit to our surprise, what we found when uh, 
treating with different proteasome inhibitors uh, like bortezomib or, or lactacystin, she couldn't see a significant effect on the oscillations, on the period of the oscillations. Yet, uh, uh, again, I want to emphasize that these drugs have a strong effect on the oscillations. They stop the oscillations quite rapidly. But at uh, uh, these uh, doses, uh, the first oscillations are maintained and they exhibit a, a normal period. So then we turn to the translation rate. And then uh, Margaret used different uh, techniques, like uh, pure mycin incorporation, uh, which uh, leads to the formation of these pure mycelated peptides that you can detect with an antibody. And then by fax, you can uh, get an idea of the, the translation uh, rate. And as you see, it's, again, we find this uh, uh, um, a significant difference between mouse and human, with the mouse being much higher than the uh, human cells. And, and then she showed that uh, by uh, blocking uh, translation using cycloexamid, which was something that Alexi Hubo in the lab had seen first in, in mouse, uh, she could slow down the pace of the oscillations when maintaining uh, the oscillations for a while. And, and this was uh, dose dependent. So this was pointing us more in the direction of the, the translation. And, uh, and, and then she further showed that when she treated with the, uh, uh, the inhibitors of uh, the, the electron transport chain, as you can see here, that has a strong impact on the pure mycin incorporation, so it decreases the, the translation. And yet, when she treated with uh, oligomycin, which has no impact on the period, she wasn't uh, seeing this, uh, this difference. So, and finally, uh, the, 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 the final experiment she did was to uh, uh, look at the incorporation of, uh, sorry, look at the pure mycin incorporation when she infected the cells with the Elbenox construct to increase the NAD over NADH ratio. And as you see here, uh, this uh, does lead to an increase of um, uh, the translation uh, rate consistent with uh, what I showed you, that the acceleration of the segmentation clock that we see upon overexpression of LBNOX, upon increasing the NAD and ADH ratio, also leads to an increase uh, in translation, which is uh, uh, similar to uh, what we've seen in the comparing mouse and, and human embryos. Yes, I'm done. So this is my final slide. Um, so, so what we think is uh, that uh, the basal metabolic rate is an important uh, uh, component of uh, the control of uh, the, the developmental pace and, and the segmentation clock period, uh, at least between mouse and, uh, and human. I, I know that uh, so Mickey presented some uh, uh, different um, uh, differences, at least in other species. So I'm not claiming that uh, this is a, a totally general rule. Um, I'm, I'm surprised that it's not more general, but uh, that's, that's uh, the way the data, the data is. Um, so, so that appears to act at the level of the electron transport chain and mitochondrial content. I think this, this really makes a lot of sense in the light of uh, what we know from the literature, like, for instance, the control of uh, the pace of both the clock and uh, the developmental rate by uh, temperature is uh, much uh, more easily explained uh, by a, a control via uh, such systems. So this acts on the redox balance, uh, uh, which uh, controls the protein synthesis rate and eventually uh, the clock rate. So you may, uh, you may wonder how this uh, might work, uh, but we haven't tested it yet, but one simple idea would be because NAD+, plus, for instance, is required for the synthesis of uh, several amino acids, like aspartate, for instance. Uh, this might be a way to explain how this indirectly controls the protein synthesis rate. And there are many different ways you could, uh, you could explain this impact. And again, I, I, I want, because that might sound confusing to you, and, and I'm sure it is also a bit to us, but uh, the, um, uh, for instance, she looked at the, the she also compared uh, these properties between uh, uh, mouse and human uh, uh, cortical uh, neuron precursors, so a different cell type from what uh, James showed, and she didn't see the differences 
in size, but she still saw the difference in metabolism. So uh, it's, a, it's a complex picture. I think that's what we can say at, uh, at this stage, and, uh, but it's very exciting, and I'm sure we'll eventually uh, uh, figure out how this all work. What uh, I also want to emphasize is that uh, this uh, control of the, the developmental rate, as we heard a lot, is uh, under genetic control because it's uh, highly variable across species. And you can imagine many ways to play on this control. Just, for instance, the control of the mitochondrial number of their activity, or there, there are simple ways you could, uh, you could imagine that would regulate uh, uh, this and so, and with this, I'm going to uh, leave you. So this is Margarete, who now started her own lab at uh, MGH as a fellow. And, um, and so, and, and she, she almost single-handedly did this, uh, this, this work during her PhD. So thank you very much.